Hello YouTubers, it is of course me Trollface the Man. Now I made an announcement a few days back via the YouTube community messenger that I'm taking a few week break from PCRT or potassium chloride reaction test. For those that followed along with my updates, some a-hole poisoned our family dog before trying to break into a detached garage on our property. Our dog was hospitalized and almost didn't make it due to bad internal bleeding from rat poison, uh, rat poison the individual apparently gave him. Needing a blood transfusion and around-the-clock care, he was able to barely pull through. Luckily, he did, and a two-week ordeal wrapped up, or so we thought. A few days after getting back, he came down with a bad case of kennel cough, and given his precarious state, needed to be monitored closely. For the last two weeks, I've been with him almost all hours of the day to make sure he continues to get better. Luckily, he has for the most part, and is almost 100% again and out of the danger zone. Even though he doesn't need to be watched like a hawk anymore, because of everything that has happened over the past month, I have many, many things backed up, and I just don't have time to record and edit PCRT episodes at the moment. I thank you for your understanding. But to at least give you guys something to watch in its place, I decided to record this video in which uh, we are going to do something that presumably has not been done on YouTube before, which is take a look at Icy Diamond thermal compound under the microscope to see exactly what it looks like. Icy Diamond is a thermal compound, or TIM, which stands for Thermal Interface Material. I'll go a bit more into detail on that in a minute. But anyways, this tube right here claims to be 92% diamond by weight, or have about 7 carats worth in it, presumably including the 8% suspension and binding material. Many do not know this, but carats is a measurement of weight. 7 carats equals 1.4 grams. If this were to be a regular diamond with the same weight and decent quality, you expect to pay on the low end maybe 10,000 American dollars, but it could go all the way up to a few hundred thousand or even more depending on quality. So for those not really into the tech scene, you might think, oh my god, that tube of tin must be outrageously expensive. But the thing is, is that it's really not at about $7 a tube. The reason being is it's comprised of synthetically grown diamond. And they are just so small, so small, they have in reality very little use and thereby value. The thing is, diamonds aren't just judged by weight, but singular size too. In general, the bigger the diamond is, the more value it has. Other factors come into play like quality such as color or clarity, but in general, the bigger the diamond, the more the price exponentially increases. So having a bigger quality diamond is better to a large extent than a set of significantly smaller diamonds that may weigh slightly more cumulatively. A stark contrast to things like gold or other precious metals that are valued almost exclusively by weight and purity and not how big a chunk is or its appearance. By the way, you might have figured this out, but I'm about 110% sure these earrings do not have real diamonds in them. Interestingly enough, though, uh, they seem to be real sterling silver. I got them at a thrift shop for $5. The gem is probably cubic zirconia, which is about 75 times cheaper per carat than diamond, or maybe even simple cut glass, which is essentially valueless. Anyways, back onto the main point, Icy Diamond is a TIM or thermal interface material. I know many of my less tech-savvy viewers might ask, what in God's name is that? Well, the general idea of thermal interface material, or simply called thermal paste, is pretty simple, but the nuances of the subject can be a little crazy in detail. I'll spare you this and instead give you the simple explanation. In this electronic age, we use devices that eat up power like it was candy. In doing so, these devices, or more specifically parts of these devices, can generate extraordinary amounts of heat. In order to keep this heat down to protect the device's electronics, we need to draw this heat away from said devices, and typically this is done by increasing surface area for, to allow for more points of dissipation. We typically achieve greater surface area by sticking a hunk of metal with grooves or fins onto the heat generating device. The fins or grooves allow for much greater surface area and thereby quicker cooling. And a fan can even be thrown into the mix on the cooler to further help carry heat away. Some examples of things that may need heat sinks attached in order to keep cool are high powered LEDs. CPUs or central processing units, these are the brain of your computer. GPUs or graphical processing units, 
which uh, play a supporting role to the CPU by taking care of graphical processing, and audio amplifiers that oftentimes have to deal with huge amounts of current passing through them. There are many more things heat sinks are used for, such as in power supplies, relays, or APUs, which are accelerated processing units, which are a combination of CPU and GPU. But the issue is if we just took a big hunk of thin metal and stuck it to any of these things, particularly I'm going to use the CPU here as an example, the thermal conductivity between the heat sink and what needs Needs to be cooled is going to be horrible. There are many reasons for this, but one of the most notable is no two surfaces are perfect in contact between each other. So in other words, uh, the contact between the heat generating device and the heat sink is never going to be 100% perfect. What that means is in any of these spaces, air is going to be between the CPU and the heat sink. So you can see that we have like a little air pocket here. And this is dramatized, of course. Air happens to be a great insulator. And because of this, heat transference suffers greatly. So you can see, for example, we have a ton of heat here. It passes through the air gap and very little heat that's actually generated in the CPU makes it into the heat sink and thereby uh, it isn't really dissipated that well. As an example of how poorly air lets heat transfer, consider for a second when taking a roast out of an oven that has been heated to 350 degrees Fahrenheit or 176.7 degrees Celsius. When you take the roast out, that air in the oven is actually 350 degrees Fahrenheit or the 176.7 degrees Celsius. However, if you're just exposed to the air for let's say 10 seconds by sticking your hand in the oven and not touching anything, uh, you'll likely Get, you know, your hand will get a little uncomfortably warm, but otherwise the heat will be tolerable. Now on the contrary, if you touch the metal or glass uh, that that roast is in, and it was at that same temperature for even a few seconds, you'll likely get burned and pretty badly. This has to do with thermal mass too, but the main part of it is air is just really bad at transferring heat. So this air is gonna significantly hinder the ability for the heat sink to function. So one of the big ideas of thermal paste is to fill these air gaps due to imperfections in the surfaces along with scratches that also trap air. And instead of having that heat sink and chip act as like two separate things kind of pushed together with an air gap in between, they function more as a solid unit. So we have the thermal interface material or TIM in between the gap now and it's actually not allowing things to transfer perfectly but we're getting a lot higher uh, heat transference or thermal transference between the CPU and the heat sink now keeping the CPU cooler allowing the heat sink to dissipate more and overall allow the devices to function cooler and hopefully longer. Now you might ask does it really work? Well, to say the least, if you're supposed to use thermal paste and you don't, it won't be a case of something running a few degrees hotter. It'll likely be a case of whatever that was supposed to be cooled dying, either instantaneously with a load or pretty quickly afterwards. This effect can be so profound that even different thermal paste or improper applications can change the temperatures. For example, this CPU will run by sometimes in excess of 20 degrees Celsius or 36 degrees Fahrenheit. That is a fair bit seeing as most electronics like CPUs or GPUs run pretty hot anyways with a heatsink and a fan and are not supposed to go much over 90 degrees Celsius or 194 degrees Fahrenheit. And every degree hotter it runs means the vice will likely die just a little bit sooner as heat degrades electronic components. Okay, I understand. You get it. I apologize. I know I ramble. On to the next thing you're likely asking. Why diamond? That is a good question and one I asked just the same when I first heard about this. As it turns out, not only is diamond the hardest naturally occurring substance on earth, diamond is too amazing for conducting thermally. How amazing? Well, one of the most known about thermal paste out there is Arctic Silver 5. Name given because it actually contains real silver to help it conduct thermally. Silver, like what is used in Arctic Silver 5, has a thermal conductivity of 400 watts per meter Kelvin. To put it how amazing diamond is, its thermal conductivity is about 2000 through 2500 watts per meter Kelvin. So based on that, it is 5 through 6.25 times better at conducting heat than pure silver. Now, icy diamond, just like the Arctic silver, is not going to have the same thermal conductivity of its pure substances. But damn, does diamond have silver and any other metals beat big time by itself. 
And seeing as Icy Diamond is 92% diamond, it should in theory be amazing, right? But once again, thermal paste are not going to be as good as their pure substances. Icy Diamond's thermal conductivity is actually only 4.5 watts per meter Kelvin. This, however, is strange because Arctic Silver 5 claims to have a thermal conductivity of 8.9 watts per meter Kelvin, almost double that of IC's. But when you look at benchmarks, where people have tested thermal paste to see how well they work, Icy Diamond beats Arctic Silver 5 out almost every time. So it's fair to assume that either one manufacturer is overestimating or fudging their heat claims, one manufacturer is grossly underestimating the performance of their product, or other factors are coming into play that allows Icy Diamond to beat Arctic Silver 5, even though it supposedly has a lower thermal conductivity potential. Mind you, it is just a few degrees at best most of the time, and either one of these are very fine thermal paste to use. Interestingly enough, they actually have metal-based thermal compounds that you can use instead of thermal paste to fuse your heat spreader, that is the metal part on your CPU here, uh, or just bare chip to a heat sink and literally make it essentially one unit that has been welded or soldered together. There are a few problems with this, such as many metal paste or liquid metals being gallium based, which will wreck, just absolutely destroy aluminum heat sinks. Liquid metal tims are also conductive and can destroy sensitive electronics if you accidentally get some where it's not supposed to go. And like I said, they fuse stuff together, making it potentially difficult, if impossible, to get stuff back apart again without causing damage. But them being fused together gives you about the best thermal contact you can possibly get. And for example, Thermal Grizzly's Conducto Knot, which is a liquid metal thermal compound, has a supposed thermal conductivity of 73 watts per meter Kelvin, which is 16 times that of Icy Diamond. But those amazing numbers aside, during benchmarks, Icy Diamond can almost match those temperatures, usually falling about one degree Celsius short or 1.8 degrees Fahrenheit of liquid metal's performance. The reason for this is less likely to do with theoretical thermal conductivity of these paste and more about saturating the heat dissipation devices such as a heat sink or radiators on a water cooling loop. In other words, both Icy Diamond along with some other select paste and liquid metal alloy carry heat away so fast that the heat sink or radiator can't di dissipate it quick enough and acts as a bottleneck to the high thermal conductivity potential, meaning at a certain point you'll see drastic decline in cooling performance even with much better thermal conductivity. It's just because whatever you're using to cool this thing off can't cool it off quick enough. And this is an ancient heatsink, by the way. This isn't like one that you would use in a standard computer nowadays. This is from forever ago. So Icy Diamond is a great choice for those that want close to liquid metal cooling performance, but don't want to potentially mess something up using liquid metal or pay its high price. As nice as it is though, there is downsides with Icy Diamond. Being made of literally diamonds, aka the hardest naturally occurring substance on Earth, these tiny particles can chew through just about anything if they are moved around with pressure pushed on them. For example, cleaning off Icy Diamond on a CPU using a rag may quickly strip off the CPU info printed on the front of it and thereby void your warranty. This however can be mostly avoided by using thermal grease remover that dissolves the binding agent in the IC diamond and lets it be padded off the surface instead of needing to be rubbed off using a pressure in a rag. Stripping lettering off a CPU is one thing, but I've also heard IC diamond can scratch up a CPU heat spreader, a heat sink, or water block pretty badly. That is once it's put on and then cleaned off. To be honest, in theory, I really doubt this. It's not that the diamond doesn't have a potential to scratch it, being the hardest element on Earth, or the hardest substance on Earth. I just think that the particles are too small to leave big scratches, big scratches. I think, if anything, it would polish it up if you just kept rubbing it on the surface of something. But the thing with theories is that they are often wrong, so I'll try a bit on a CPU later to see if I can get it to scratch. Anyways, now on to what this video is actually about. What does Icy Diamond look like under a microscope? Well, let's find out. I have a slide here. Of course, there'd have to be a little hair there. I have a slide here. I'm just gonna take, and I don't have much left, but I'm gonna take a little bit of this Icy Diamond, and I don't need much, because I need a thin film anyways. And I'm gonna put it on this slide, and then I am gonna drop a cover on it. And we're gonna take this, we're gonna look at it under the microscope. So you can see that there's just a little tiny bit there and that's all we need. Okay, so this is some icy diamond under 100 times zoom. What you'll likely notice is that it looks very similar to sand from the beach, but I can assure you this is much, much smaller. 
For example, here are some sand at the same 100 times zoom to compare. So at 100 times we really can't make out much of anything yet, so we'll need to go higher. Okay, we are now at 250 times zoom. At this zoom level we can just start to make out little tiny specks of something. This is the diamond particles, but we'll need to go in even further. We are now at an impressive 1000 times zoom. We are starting to see the image quality degrade significantly. This is a combination of imperfections in the microscope's lenses, the glass cover, and just diffraction from the air at such high zoom levels. We can at this point make out what is going on pretty well. These diamond particles are extraordinarily small. I'll put a sample of my blood up next to this so you can see a comparison between the sizes of the two at the same zoom level. Pretty neat, but let's go in needlessly far all the way up to 2,500 times zoom. At this level, I actually have to put some oil on the slide that the tip of the lens gets dipped into while focusing. Without the oil to change the IOR, or index of refraction value, it would literally be physically impossible to focus because even the small amount of air between the lens element and the slide would create a horrible amount of diffraction and make for an unusable image. At a full 2,500 times zoom, we are losing a significant amount of quality in our image, and we are actually approaching current physical limitations of optical microscopes. And we are at the max zoom mine is capable of. Anyways, looking at this is why I personally think it would be extremely unlikely for IC Diamond to leave any significant scratches on heat sinks, heat spreaders, or IC chips, or at least just the particles by itself. The diamonds are so exponentially small it's almost unfathomable. I'll show you a comparison of some bacteria I had too looked at so you can see just how close in size they are. Here's also a photo of my blood again and the icy diamond at 2500 times zoom. Based on the red cells being an average of 5 microns, that means most of the icy diamond particulate we see here is 1 micron or less. 1 micron is about the equivalent of 14,000 grit sandpaper. Not only are the particulates so unbelievably small, but if you look they mostly have rounded edges which means they wouldn't be as good for cutting surfaces they rub over. Once again, everything about this strikes me more as a size and shape that would polish instead of a scratch. And to further add credit to my point, anything that is about 30 microns or less is used for pre-polishing, and anything less than 10 can be used to finish polish with. Icy Diamond guarantees on their site to have particulates no bigger than 40 microns. So should IC Diamond leave significant scratches on IC chips, heat spreaders, or heat sinks and water blocks? The answer is no. By itself it should not. But before anyone assumes that I am saying it can't, stop right there because there are other factors that can come into play that we'll take a look at and test in the second part of this video that will be linked below. Thank you guys for watching, thank you to my Patreons, and if you guys like this video please let me know by dropping me a comment, a like, and subbing if you haven't already. And please click through to the next video if you want to see whether or not, in practice, Icy Diamond can leave scratches on something or not. Thank you, and bye!